go to Google and type in the word bullying, as I did, to see if there'd be any web pages devoted to that topic, uh, I can assure you you'll find a few. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I typed in, tell me about bullying, I found uh, 1.2 billion web pages. Now, not, not million, billion. 1.2 billion with a B, billion. So I took a few minutes to read all those pages. <laughs> and I've got the executive summary for you right now. Are you ready? They're against it. They're against it, every one of them. They're just against it, against, against cyberbullying and bullying at school. They don't want your kids bullied and bullying at work and there's racial bullying and there's like a disability bullying and there's every kind of bullying in the world, but I couldn't find any web pages that were for them. They were just totally against it. Just don't, don't do it. <clears throat> um, I have it on good authority that no matter how many websites there are against bullying, um, it's going to keep on going on. It's going to. And my authority is uh, the risen one. Perhaps you know him. Uh, he rose from the dead. There's all authority he has in heaven and on earth. And he said this, John 15, verse 20. He said, uh, if they bullied me, which they did, they're going to bully you. Now, I know that's, a, that's kind of a free translation of that passage in John 15, verse 20. But it's not an inaccurate one. I can assure you of that. The word that's used there is a word that you could replace for what people mean by today's word, bullying. What they mean is like to intimidate, to harass, to belittle, right? Even physically bully you with, with their, their actions, to, uh, to ostracize you, to exclude you, uh, to somehow try to make your life difficult. That's bullying. And, and certainly Jesus had that in mind when he said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you because... All the things he says about persecution, it runs the gamut all the way down to just saying bad things about you, saying things behind your back. He talked about that, that they're going to revile you and exclude you and say all kinds of evil things about you. He says, it's going to happen because no servant is greater than his master. If I'm the top of this pyramid here and, and I got bullied, oh, you're going to get bullied. Now, um, <clears throat> I don't care how, you can have, you can have 1.2 gazillion web pages against it. You wag your finger at everybody and say, it's bad, it's bad, you shouldn't do it. It's going to happen. There's going to be bullying in particular against Christians, I assure you, all the way to the end. Matter of fact, it's going to go from bad to worse. And, um, and so there's no passages in the Bible that you can find that are going to say, here's how you get rid of that. Here's how you stop people from persecuting. Here's how you stop people from reviling. Here's how you stop people from bullying you. You, you won't find those passages, but you'll have a lot of passages that will say, here's the kind of bullying you should expect. And uh, here's what you ought to do about it. And those are very helpful passages. And, and I've called this series for the next eight weeks, I've called it uh, Christians on Trial. And, 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 and there are always going to be that, there's going to be that sense of like you're put on trial, put you under the microscope. They're going to analyze you, and they're not going to analyze you fairly because you as, a, a, ally yourself with Christ. Like I stand with him. And because of their ridicule for him and what he said, they're going to do the same to you. Jesus said that's going to happen. And, and what we're going to study in chapters 24, 25, and 26 for the next eight weeks, which, by the way, is like, like light speed uh, for the, through the book of Acts, right? Since we've been in it, since I was 16, we've been studying Acts. Um, it's, it, I know, we're gonna, this is fast. But Paul goes through trials, and a lot of them are the same. Matter of fact, he repeats a lot of these things in, in these trials. But he's on trial starting in chapter 24 before the governor of the whole area of Judea. Southern Israel. He's in charge. He's a, he's a Roman official sent from Rome across the Mediterranean, and he's in charge of this area. And Paul is taken there, and he starts a trial. It's the first real, like, serious, like, legal trial before the Romans. And, and so it is a trial, and I want to use that terminology, but I doubt any of you are going to go before the governor of our state uh, with attorneys and flanked by people, you know, with big briefcases. I, I, I don't know that, at least you, maybe your kids or grandkids, but you probably won't be on that kind of trial. But Jesus, when he talked about the opposition we're going to receive, uh, it, it's a kind of, of, of bullying we're, we're going we're gonna to have to have a, a preparation for. We need to know what to expect and what to do about it. And Paul gives a great primer by his life, kind of giving us a template of the, this is the kind of things you should expect, and here's how you should respond. So we want to look at that for the next eight weeks. We're going to start with the first nine verses 
And I want you to look at it with me because we're going to find answers to how we should deal with what we're going to deal with. And while we have to attenuate a bit of what he's dealing with, because he's literally on trial for his life, this is where this is going to go in the book of Acts. Uh, I I hope that your bullying is less than that, uh, and I hope that it will be for our lifetime. Perhaps it won't, but whatever. We're going to get ready by looking at this and kind of saying, well, how does this apply to us today? And we'll find some answers in the text today. So turn there with me. Acts chapter 24, we've only got time for the first nine verses, and we really don't even have time for that. (laughs) That never stops me, so. Acts 24. You followed me, I hope, in in, in where we're at, and Paul here now is finally taken from Jerusalem (coughs) to Caesarea on the Mediterranean coast, and it says after he got there and he's there, it says after five days, verse 1. The high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullius. Okay, down. They're coming from Jerusalem. Everything's down, even though it's northeast, or I'm sorry, northwest from Jerusalem, still down. And and that's directional indicators whenever you come down from Jerusalem because it's an elevated place and the most important city in the mind of the Jewish people. Luke says, coming down. So coming down to the Mediterranean, who is? Well, Paul got there with a big entourage and and a whole protective service and protective custody all the way to Caesarea, but now we have the high priest. He's the number one guy in in religious Judaism of the first century. His name is Ananias, and he's coming, and he's got a whole team of the elders. In other words, the ruling class of Israel, probably members of the Sanhedrin, the the, the Supreme Court of Israel, and a spokesman, this is an interesting Greek word, probably referring to an official lawyer, like a a litigator. Uh, He's an orator. He's He's a rhetorician. He's one who's able to stand up and argue a case before Roman officials. That's probably why Tertullius, why he has the name that's not a Jewish name. So he's retained by the Jewish leaders, and he's going to argue his case. Maybe he's done it before. I assume he has. These Jews are smart. They're probably going to get a guy that's experienced, and he's going to come, and he's going to lay the case before the governor named Felix, and and they're going to put Paul on trial. Verse 2. And when he had been summoned, Tertullius began to accuse him, that's Paul, saying, since through you, right, talking to Felix now, we enjoy much peace, the lawyer's saying, since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere. We accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, we know your time is important, Felix. I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. Super sicky sweet there, right? I mean, it's more than like if it pleased the court and your honor. This is like he's leaning into this. And now here it comes. Verse 5, for you found this man a plague, right? Kevin, you're such a disease, right? This is like you're, 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 you're just laying into this with an ad hominem argument. You're just, this guy's a bad guy. He's bad. He's a plague. What does he do? Why? Because he stirs up riots among all the Jews, not just in, not just in Israel. I mean, Asia, like the whole, he's messed up the whole world, this, this disease, this man named Paul throughout the whole world, because he's like the top dog. He's the ringleader. He's the one whipping up these people of the sect of the Nazarenes. He's even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him, speaking on behalf of the Jews here, the leaders. By examining him yourself, oh, amazing Felix, right? You look so good today, right? You will be able to find out uh, from him about everything of which we accuse him. And then the Jews, man, they were like, yeah. They joined in the charge affirming that all these things were so. Maybe it's more like the, the parliament in, in, in England, right? It's like, they, they, I don't know, they're like barking up, everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe this is a, a reference to them bringing in, in people, whatever. Everyone just joins in. Bad guy, plague, disease, riot guy, you know, sect, ringleader, bad guy, profaning religious, you know, people in Jerusalem, and off they go. Paul starts his defense in, in verse 10, that's next time. Let's just look at this, right? the charges. Now, again, we have to attenuate a little bit. Right? We have to bring it down from you being on trial with lawyers flanking you uh, and, and being accused and in the, you know, in the, in the witness box. And, and we're going to think, okay, what kinds, of things is, what kinds of things are happening to Paul? What are they saying about Paul that they might say about you? Because Paul is a follower of Christ. He's a proponent of Christianity. You're a proponent of Christianity, I trust, if you're a Christian. And what are they going to say? What kind of stuff should you expect? So let's give a heading to this, and then let's just analyze the charges, and let's just head it this way. Expect 
criticisms like these. And for you, I'm assuming it's just criticism. It may accelerate to something greater. You might lose a job over it, might lose a client, might, might lose a promotion, might lose some friends. Uh, I don't know. I mean, who knows? You could lose a lot. But it starts with the criticism. It's the opposition. Okay. Now, what is the opposition? You notice the verses next to this first point take us right to the heart of it in verses 5 and 6. And I want to start with the charges. Now, four things we could say. One of them is kind of a header to it all. But it starts with, you know, you're a plague. This guy's a plague. Verse 5, we found this man a plague. That's what he is. Who stirs up riots among all the Jews, right? All the Jews throughout the world, ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, even tried to profane the temple, but we seized them. Okay, that's the charge. Let's start with the first line, okay? We'll get our letter A from this. You're a plague. It's not, a, it's not, it's not nice, right? You're not nice. You're, you're, you're just bad. You're bad. You're just bad for, for the world. You, and all these are plurals that I'm going to have you write down, so y'all, if you're from the South, right, you need to know, letter A, here's what they're going to say about you, even though you might not go to court, might not go to jail. They're going to say the same thing they said about Paul, because you're going to stand with Christ, he stood with Christ. Letter A, they're going to say, you're bad for society. You're all bad for society. You, you and your church and your group, you're just bad. You're bad for, for society, or to put it in the words of a website that I looked up, just to, didn't take me long to say, what are, what are people saying about Christians these days? Here, here was the, the, the headline. Christians, they are a scourge of humanity. I'm like, oh, okay. <clears throat> I mean, we cause trouble. We're, we're upsetting everything everywhere. Now, you know, anyone can get a web page, right? There's, there's 1.2 billion on fully. Clearly, anyone can say anything. I get that. How about best-selling books? that have really broken all the records for selling books about religion. And they're not from religious people, they're from atheists. And you know, you've studied a little bit about the opposition to Christianity in our generation. It really started with these four horsemen of the new militant atheists that have gone after us. And so go back to the turn of, of the millennia here, right? Beginning of the 2000s, and think of some of the things that were written about us in these books, okay? Um, here's Christopher Hitchens in his book, 2008, page 58. Uh, Christians, talking about us now. They're violent, they're irrational, they're intolerant, they're, they're allied right, to racism, they're tribal, and they're full of bigotry. Um, you could say, you're a plague. That's what Christians are. You become a Christian, you're bad for, that's not good for society, right? That's not good for, Harris, right? And, and, and Hitchens, they, they keep going. You can add Dawkins to it in a minute, but they're, they all keep going. Uh, they say, uh, we are, here it comes, positively immoral. And religion, Christianity in particular, is a false picture of the world to the innocent. People just out there, and then they're hit with the religious, hit with us Christians, right? They're just fine, whether it's in Thessalonica or Colossae or Ephesus or, you know, Orange County or, 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 or middle of, of Phoenix or, or in, in Cleveland, doesn't matter. Christians come, and they start messing it all up. We are the kind, it says here, that are promoting this eternal reward or this eternal punishment, this bifurcation of where you're gonna go when you die. That's what Christianity is all about. And they impose impossible tasks and rules upon people. We start telling people, like, you shouldn't look at pornography, right? And, and you shouldn't cheat on your wife, and, and you shouldn't cheat at work, and you should tell the truth. You know, you shouldn't curse, all these things. Impossible, right? It's impossible. You're saddling us with all this guilt, right? And they encourage an extreme self-centeredness. Ultimately, they're saying, they're just a bunch of self-centered people and full of conceit. Okay, these are the charges against Sunday school teachers in Nebraska, right? Uh, Christian college students in Kentucky, right? People like us who gather together to read the Bible. This has become, and again, they, these guys are selling way more books than your pastor will ever sell. More people are reading what they write than, 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 than me and 10 pastors combined. This is, right, an increasing view of how people look at Christianity, and the more our society continues to, quote, unquote, progress as they slide off, uh, you know, the table into, into the garbage can, right, we're going to continue to have this accusation against us. And, and that is, letter A, you're bad for society. You're bad for society. You're not good for, you do not produce goodwill. You are, to put it in the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, you are the scum of the world. Matter of fact, let's look at that passage real quick. So important that the Apostle Paul would say that because he's trying to correct a kind of thinking that is all over Orange County churches, all over Orange County churches. And that is that you can have 
an alliance with Christ. And not only will he make your life better, but as he makes your life better, right, and, and, and you are healthier and wealthier and your skin is clear and you have more hair on the top of your head, right, you will ultimately have really the respect and accolades of everyone. They're wondering, like, how are you not on, you know, bipolar medication? That's amazing. You're great. We want to learn from you. We want to sit at your feet and learn from you, oh, Christian, so blessed in your life. Okay, this is the kind of tripe that goes on in a lot of places as they're pushing a Christianity in a culture, by the way, that is pretty well off, upper middle class Orange County. If you've heard me quote the book 1 Corinthians before, and I'd like you to turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I, I think you've heard me say this. Corinth in the first century was the Orange County of the ancient world. They, they were well-to-do. I mean, it wasn't Rome, it wasn't Athens, but they were doing really well. This was not Bel Air, right? But it's Orange County. These guys, they're doing well. Now, Christ comes to, to Corinth, and uh, people start adding Christianity to their portfolio of stuff. You know, along with their, their bike rides in the morning and their Peloton and their crunches and, you know, they're eating their, their strained juices and their, their essential oils. They, now, I got Christ now. This is good really good for me. And they start to sense this, this, it's going to better, this is a life betterment plan. I mean, my books on Christianity, they're right there in the self-help section. And, and Paul just castigates them in this passage. Take a look at it. First Corinthians chapter four, the orange county of the ancient world. Here's what he says. Let's start in verse eight. And by the way, if you read first and second Corinthians, these are the two most, these two books of the New Testament are dripping with more sarcasm than any other book of the New Testament. Dripping with sarcasm. And, and 2 Corinthians is even worse than 1 Corinthians, or better, depending on if you like sarcasm. Verse 8, already you have all you want. You have all you want. Already you've become rich. And without us, you've become king. We've seen all your graphics for your church sermon series. You're kings and princes, and it's awesome. All that sarcasm, why maybe our translators need to put exclamation points behind it, because it's sarcastic. Because what he says, and would that you did reign. In other words, you're kidding yourself. Christianity does not make you have all that you want. It does not make you rich, and it does not make you influential in society where people are sitting here saying, tell us how you do it. That's not it. Would that you did have that. Would that you were there so that we might share the rule with you. Oh, our theology is going to get us there, but it gets us there when Christ comes back for that kingdom we've been praying for when Christ arrives to get his church. And he sets up a kingdom on earth, and guess what? Then we will reign. But guess what, Corinthians? You're not getting there ahead of me, Paul says. Impossible. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles, which, by the way, you are there ascribing to this, uh, subscribing to this theology of Christianity, and you got it from the apostles, and the apostles are the leader at the top of the pyramid of knowing and living out Christianity. It is the apostles. And here you are, this church in nice suburban, you know, Corinth, and all of a sudden now he says, listen, we are the leaders of this movement, and we are like, last of all, we're like men sentenced to death, like they're dragging us through the streets and want to kill us. We become a spectacle to the world to angels, to men. Everyone thinks we're just trash. Matter of fact, they think we're dumb. Verse 10, we're fools for Christ's sakes. Oh, but you are so wise in Christ, you smarty pants, right? We're weak. Look at us. We're weak. We're in prison. We're being hauled out of town after they throw rocks at us. They, they leave us for dead in the streets of our mission field. Oh, but you're so strong. You got it. You're held in honor. You're becoming the, the, the employee of the month in your companies. We're right, in disrepute. They hate us. To the very present hour, like right now, we can't get food. They won't serve us beverages. We're poorly dressed. We're buffeted. We're homeless. And we're, we're laboring, working with our own hands. No one's handing us anything. When reviled, we turn around and live by the Christian principles, and we bless. But we are reviled. And when we're persecuted, we just we gut it out. We endure. When slandered, like it's happening in, in Acts 24, 25, and 26, right? we entreat. We're going to have a, 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 a defense. We're going to respond. We have become and still are like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Now you say, dude, you need some medication, a good psychiatrist. You need to slow down. Take a vacation, Paul. Scum of the earth, you're not the scum of the earth. You're a nice guy. We've read your books, right? 
You seem happy. No, we're the refuse, the dung. The, we're the poop of the world. That's, that's what he said. You don't see that on day spring cards, right? Christians, right? Poop of the world. Scum of the earth. And Paul says, that's what we're experiencing. Oh, but you guys, you got it made. I get absolutely disgusted by some of the preaching that I hear going on on platforms by people that promise things they don't even experience and live. They don't even experience and live. The stuff they offer to their congregations as they pass the plate and pretend that Christianity is supposed to make you popular and healthy and no zits, right, and, and thin base, uh, waistlines, and you'll probably just stand up straighter. It'll be awesome. These guys are influencers. They're not preachers. And they're telling you things that are not true. They're ripping people off. They're putting people in a place of, 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 of hanging on to, biting into false hopes that will do nothing but be disillusioned. And these churches and these pulpits that are, that are proffering this stuff, you just need to know this, it's a revolving door. It's a revol- They come in, they start to believe what the preachers are saying, and, and then in time they go, this is disillusioned, I don't like this, is, but that's okay. Somebody else coming right behind him because we're standing on stage and saying, you get Christ, everything's gonna be great. He's so great, he's so awesome. Everyone's gonna love you, you're gonna be great. Family, fantastic, right? Your health, good. Your job, you're gonna ascend and soar nonsense. Here's what I'm telling you. You want, to, you want to, to, to ally yourself with Christ and subscribe to biblical Christianity? It's going to get harder. You should expect that they're going to say you're bad for society. And, and you're not, Paul says, look, look. I mean, this is a, I can just read the passage. This is what it is. This is the answer. It's, it's a, 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 a priority, value, expectation, adjustment. Great sermon after Easter, Pastor. I brought friends and everything. This is not what I wanted. It gets worse. But here's what I'll say. You may not have had anything to do this week. Say, hey, you're a Christian and you're bad for society. I'll bet people have thought it if they know you're a Christian. Number two, I guarantee you, you've heard this one. Go back to our passage, letter B. Here it is, verse number five. What's the second thing they say? You stir up riots among all the Jews throughout the world. If you just keep your mouth shut, you come into town, everyone's mad at you. They don't like what you're saying. This is bad, right? And the reason they think it's bad is because we come in and say things they don't like. And then you don't back down because you say, this is true, this is right. This particular charge speaks to our epistemology. It speaks to what we think we know and how we think we know it and what is true and our understanding, our philosophy of what truth is. Christians have believed from the very beginning and Western society was pretty much built on this idea that truth is really a statement, an assertion of some, some comporting with reality. That what I'm saying, it, it comports with something objectively true, right? Until Oprah came along and said, no, it's about my truth. My truth, your truth. A classic modernistic way of thinking. Christianity has said, like, there is a God. It's the fool that says there is no God. Because you can't say, well, I'm an atheist. Well, that's nice. I, I'm a Christian. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. There either is a God or there isn't a God. Well, you believe God made us? Well, I, I watch the Discovery Channel. I, God didn't make us. Oh, that's nice. That's not how this works. There is either God or there isn't a God. He either created us or he didn't create us. Oh, and there was this thing, like the, the movie a long time ago, the, the Ten Commandments, God gave these rules, right? Oh, you're saying that? I don't think those rules are, I, I don't even believe, I just think that the whole book probably developed from, you know, just rewritten and uh, translation after don't believe all that. Okay, well, there is a God or there isn't a God. He either created us or didn't. He either gave us a set of rules or he didn't. And then all that stuff about he's going to judge us, he's going to call us to account for what we do. He either is or he isn't, right? It's either true or it isn't. Christianity gets a bad rap because people are saying this is a statement that corresponds to something that's real, something that is true. And if you disagree with it, oh, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. You're wrong. Dun, dun, dun. You can't do that. You know what that is? That's being judgmental. You are judgmental. Let her be. You're going to be accused of this, right? You're judgmental, especially your pastor, right? Your, your church, trust me, judgmental. Your church is judgmental. You are judgmental. Okay. Just, by the way, just point out to the person that says that to you, are you being judgmental about the fact that we're judgmental? 
what do you mean? Are you sure we're judgmental? Are you, are you saying we're absolutely judgmental? Are you saying that we're not, not judgmental? Are you saying that we're actually, like, corresponds with truth that we are judgmental? And you're saying, you've, you're saying that. No, that's not my truth. We're not judgmental. Or no, but you're sure we're judgmental. You can't have it both ways. I, the Greek New Testament, the Greek language is so great because so much of our, our vocabulary comes from Greek. Not that this particular word does. <laughs> but the word that translates into judge, which you're not supposed to do because there's a Bible verse about that somewhere, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Not supposed to do that. Um, more on that in a minute. Is the word krino. Krino. Which doesn't mean anything when you hear it. Just know that when you hear the word krino, which is the verb I, I judge, it translates judge, depending on how it's inflected in different ways. It's krino, judge. Here's something that's helpful. If you go, like, you take a 101 Greek class across the street, you're going to have to learn vocabulary words. Here's a frequently used word you're going to have to learn, apokrino. Apokrino is a compound word with a preposition in front of it, apo. Right? And, and here's, here's what we're saying when we say, here's the translation of the word apokrino. The, and it's so helpful. The, the translation of the word apocrino that you're going to have to learn in your vocabulary list is the word to answer. I answer. Apocrino, right? To, to give an answer. Actually, it's not a verb in that sense. Apocrino is, is to, to answer. Here's the answer. <clears throat> everyone who gives an answer is making a crino, a judgment. Everyone, everyone who is going to respond, what do you think of this? That is a judgment, a judgment. And if you say that your judgment is right, right? You are now, right, as judgmental as anyone on the planet. Everyone is judgmental. Dennett, Hitchens, Dawkins, all of them are judgmental. And a lot of their books are about how judgmental we are. I get it. I understand it. Because you're trying to make an assertion that corresponds with what you think is true. And so to do, the only way to do that is to get into the squishy Oprah land of saying, there is no truth. Is your truth my truth? Whatever your truth, all roads lead to heaven, which she loves to say, right? Or used to say, I don't know, Oprah's yesterday's news, whoever the new person is. And the idea of all this is that we are going to say, listen, I know you think we're judgmental. And you know why Paul caused, caused riots when he went into towns? He would go into the synagogues and he'd say, here's Isaiah, here's Jeremiah, here's Malachi. You know who it is? Jesus of Nazareth. This is the guy. And they would say, no, it's not. And he'd say, yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Why didn't they want that? Because he died on a cross. I don't believe our Messiah is going to die on a cross. You're wrong. Paul would say, oh, but let's look about dying on a cross. Isaiah 53, there are passages in Scripture. How about Moses, even the idea of the sacrificial lamb? Yes, the Messiah was going to die on a cross. You just weren't reading the Scripture carefully enough. Look at it again. No, you're wrong. We will not believe that. So riots were caused. The most important person in biblical prophecy is the Christ. And Paul was saying, this is the Christ. He just died in Jerusalem and rose from the dead on the third day. That's too crazy. Don't believe it. Riots. People disagree. Anybody who's going to cause a stir, let's just call it that, where you're judgmental, is because you're making statements of truth, assertions about reality, and you're saying you're right to agree with this assertion that corresponds to reality, or you're wrong if you, if you deny it. And I'm just saying, that's, that, is, that, is the, that is the, we traffic in that. That is the whole point. To share the gospel is to make an assertion about something we think corresponds to reality. You're just gonna have to accept that. You should expect that. And it's funny because they live in, in judgmental world all day long. When they go to the produce section of the grocery store, judgment, 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 right? When they talk to their kids about how they all live, judgment, 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 judging all the time. Every answer they give is a judgment. I know we don't like the, and first, John chapter seven, by the way, verse one, do not judge, period. No, nope, it's not what it is. Do not judge, right? For you're gonna be judged in the same way that you judge and how you measure it can be measured back. And he says, you know what? Here's the problem. You are trying to make judgments with big old logs in your eye and you need to take the, the log out of your eye so that you'll never judge anyone. Sunday school grads, is that how the passage ends? Take the log out so then you will see clearly to take the log or the speck rather out of your brother's eye. Matter of fact, jot this down, people that are getting tired of the accusation that we're judgmental. John chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus, do not judge, uh-oh, by appearances, but judge, this is an imperative now, judge with righteous judgment. Judge with right judgment. Judge appropriately. You can't judge a book by its cover. That's true. Don't judge by mere appearances. 
Right? There can be a, a, a tax collector on the temple mount. You think he's scum of the earth. You just look at the, you look at the external, but look at what he does. Look at what he says. Look at how he goes home contrite, trusting in the Lord's mercy for forgiveness. He's a brother in Christ. Don't judge by mere appearances. Judge with righteous judgment. Everyone's going to judge. Judge rightly. That's the point. Expect criticisms like you're bad for society, you're such a disease, right? And you're judgmental. That's going to happen. Back to our passage. Acts chapter 24, verse 5. Because you know this guy's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He's a Nazarene guy. The Nazarene. Now, I grew up down the street from Nazarene Church. Ride my bike past it all the time. I didn't think it was a bad word. Fine word. Nice, nice cars in the parking lot. It seems like a nice building. The hedges were nicely turned on Nazarenes. Oh, these guys are Nazarenes. I go to a Baptist church. He goes to Nazarene church. Whatever, fine. It's not, it, wasn't a fine, it wasn't a fine word in the first century. Nazarene. Remember in John chapter 1, Nathaniel, Philip, they had this discussion. I think I found the Christ, you know, the one the Bible talks about, the Old Testament. And, 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 and the response was, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth. Now, I'm thinking of, of geographical locations on the map right now, which I won't say because I get in trouble when I say those things. You know what cities I'm thinking of. And, and we have this sense of reputation about a particular place. This to them in Israel, in, in, in the, the, the snooty areas around Jerusalem, if you were from Nazareth, not only did you have an accent, which, by the way, that Peter was called out by the servant girl in Caiaphas' courtyard, you were with him. Why? Because he has an accent of a northerner from Galilee. And they didn't like that because there were Jews there, but there were a lot of Gentiles there. I mean, they named the, the, the whole giant lake after Tiberius. I mean, this was, not, this was not the place to be if you're a devout Jew. And Jesus, for prophetic reasons, was, was slated after being born in Bethlehem, as Micah 5.2 says he should be, he's now raised in Nazareth. And they don't like him because he's from Nazareth. And then you add the word sect to it. Sect is not a nice word. Sect. You're from a little sect, aren't you? You're a little break-off splinter group from the real group. Now, you're like, that's like cult. You're just in this cult group of the hicks, right? You're probably just grasping to your guns and your God and your religion. That, you're just, you're just a deplorables of society. Sorry, more political talk. You guys are just, let's put it this way, let her see, simpletons, simpletons. You probably don't even know how to find access to the Discovery Channel. You are so simple. You don't, you don't understand it. You don't believe it. You probably think God created the world. You're so dumb. It was an explosion. Uh, you're so dumb. You're dumb. You guys have probably never been to school. Anybody educated in your church? Where'd you pastor? Where'd you go to buy? You go Christian school, Sunday school school? Is that where you went? You guys, you don't know anything. You're dumb. You think miracles. You think Jesus rose from the dead? You're dumb. Bible, you believe in the Bible? Dude, I saw the Da Vinci Code. That's not how the Bible came to be. You don't know that. I watched a whole 90-minute movie to learn how the Bible came to be. Your pastor's preaching from it like it's some authoritative book. So dumb. You're so dumb. You're so dumb. You know, at work, they think that about you as soon as you speak up about God and you start saying things like, I believe you do. I think I created the world. Mm. Yep. Don't tell them you think it was in six days. Woo. Uh, dumb, dumb, dumb. I'm just telling you this. Get used to being called a simpleton. The whole point, even earlier as Paul was standing in the trial, when he believed that there was a resurrected dead body that came to life, and his, and his name is Jesus, split, yeah, it did cause riots. And they thought, that's dumb. You're going to be called a simpleton. Just take some time at some point to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And just remember this. Start just in the middle. Verse 18. They think the cross is folly. Why? The cross is the apex of our theology. There is a God. He did create us. He did give us rules. We broke those rules. So he says, you're going to be cast out. But instead of being cast out, right, you're going to be able to be part of my team if you get the imputed righteousness of Christ and if your sin can be appended to his punishment. The cross is the centerpiece of that. The only reason I think I have a relationship with the living God and one day we'll meet him is because the cross. Dumb. He talks about the Greeks, they just, want, they just want more knowledge, want more wisdom. The Jews, there's no way our Messiah could have been crucified. No way. We know he's not the Messiah just because he got crucified. The cross is a stumbling block to the Jews. Right? To the Greeks, it's folly, it's foolishness. And then he starts talking about the church. Yeah, and in your church, just remember this. God chooses the base things to shame the wise things. He picks people, little runts, little redheaded runts like David, 
He doesn't take him from the, from the, uh, the, 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 the military academy. He t- plucks him out of the field as a shepherd. And even when dad was visited by Samuel, like, I'm looking for a king. Well, here's all my sons. And God goes, nope, 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 nope. This is all the sons you have? No, I got one more, but he's just watching the sheep. You don't want to see him. He's short. <laughs> Which isn't really a joke because Saul, the first king, tallest guy around, head and shoulders above everybody else. The short runt shepherd with no training, no military training, no military experience, right? He becomes the king. God takes the base things of the world to shame the wise. And the whole point in that passage at the end is so that we wouldn't boast before God. It isn't about you. We don't have more PhDs in this room than you might have, you know, in the faculty lounge at UCI. I get it. I understand. It's okay. God chooses just normal people to open their eyes to see the truth of the gospel. And guess what? One day everyone's going to learn that God did create the world. It's like he turns water into wine in a millisecond. He created the world milliseconds at a time in a six-day period to teach us how to work in a given week. There's no astronomical reason that we should have a week. God created the world in six days. The whole point was to give us a pattern of work and rest. Whatever. You can debate me on that if you want. Here's the thing. We're all going to find out, as it says in that passage, that the wise at the universities are going to be shamed right, by the simple people like your grandma who read the Bible and said, oh, I believe it, because it's true. Simpletons, get used to that, get ready for that. It's foolishness to the world. How about this, verse six? He even tried to profane the temple. Are you still in the passage? Acts 24, six. He tried to profane the temple. Those Jews are going about their business. They got all these guys that dress well. They're, like, they, they're so sincere. And he comes in there and he's got a buddy who's a Gentile. We kind of think he might have even brought him to the court of the, of, of the Jews. And so he probably profaned the temple. We think he profaned. Did Paul have this brotherly relationship with the Gentile when he walked into Jerusalem? Yes. Did he bring him into the court of the, of the Jews? No. This is a false charge, obviously, but they thought you are just not, you're not playing by the religious rules of our culture. Paul understood that. And people don't like it when you start saying, back to number letter B, when you start saying, well, this is true and that's not true. This is right, that's wrong. When you start saying that and start talking about the guys in saffron robes with bald heads and they don't wear shoes and they're so godly, and look at them, they're burning their incense, they're praying all day, they live in monasteries. You're not telling me they're wrong. Don't tell me that. Don't tell, wrong. And what does wrong mean in your theology? They're going to hell, they're not going to hell. What are you are such a religious big? Put it this way, letter D. You start messing with religion, say your religion's right and their religion's wrong. You are disrespecting other religions. And that's the thing in our day. Well, disre- don't you disrespect me. This is like, like the, it's, the, it's the unforgivable sin. That you're saying the Muslims, right, praying five times a day, traveling to, to, to Mecca and Medina, they're, they don't even eat during Ramadan in the daylight hour. These guys are serious. What do you do? Are you volunteer for fix-it day on a Saturday? Come on. These guys are serious about their religion. Don't you tell me they're going to hell and you're going to heaven because you just prayed some prayer one day. They will castigate you, they will belittle you, and they will say, you, one of your big problems is you think Jesus is the only way. And you're supposed to say to that, on the authority of your pastor, you're absolutely right. I think that because Jesus said that. He said that and it makes logical sense. Jesus is the only way. That's what he said. He made it clear in multiple ways and said it as explicitly as you could possibly say it. In John 14, 6, right? There is, right, nothing, there's nothing else but Christ. He is the way, the only way, the truth. He's the only truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father, Jesus said, except through me. Now, if I say something different, then I'm not loyal to my leader. And my leader was clear. And that's why in Acts 4, 12, they were very loyal to their leader. And they sat there in front of the crowds. And they say, there's no other name, no other person. Right? Under heaven, given among men, by which we must be saved. And we're the only religion, you need to know this, with a mechanism for redemption. Think about it. I, I can talk to the Muslim who thinks he's so much more righteous than I am because he's so de- devout, devoted to his religion. And I have had many conversations. And I say, where do you get your sin problem dealt with? Are you a sinner? Yes, I'm a sinner. Well, I'm a sinner too. How do you, how does, how do you God going to accept you into paradise one day? Well, he's merciful. Well, I believe that he's merciful, but he's also holy. If he's holy, how in the world does it get dealt with? And, and, and the answer is 
He's just going to hope that my good works are going to get me there. And I think now we're on the even playing field with every other religion in the world. Here's the ladder to try and get good enough. And God's going to look past the fact that who's climbing the ladder is a sinner. You're you're never going to make it. I need to have the imputed righteousness of Christ applied to my life and my sin somehow extracted from my life and put on some payment that's worthy. It's called the cross. And it's folly to the world. And I am saying you're wrong. And if I love you enough, I'll tell you you're wrong. And I'll tell you, you ought to put your trust in Christ. He's not a prophet in your book that doesn't die and doesn't rise. Right? <laughs> that you, you have Isa in the Quran. That's nifty. That's super nifty. Right? But he doesn't effectuate the means of your atonement. You don't even think that he died on a cross. So we got a big problem. You need the Christ of history, the Christ of the Bible who takes away your sin, like a lamb, the lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. That's the picture. The innocent dies for the guilty so we can go free. If that's disrespect for other religions, I guess sign me up for being called that. I'm not being, I'm not being belligerent. I'm not trying to be mean. Matter of fact, the only reason I'm sharing with my Muslim friend about being safe is because I care. You're not a bigot because you state the truth. All right, that's the kind of things you're going to hear. You are not good for society. All that stuff about sexual ethics and the sanctity of life is not good. You're causing trouble, making people feel bad. And then you're saying it like they're wrong. You're judgmental and you're dumb anyway. You don't even believe in the Discovery Channel. And, you know, you disrespect other religions because you think they're wrong. Okay. Verses 5 and 6. That, those are the accusations. Look at the tactics, though. The tactics are telling as well. Let's just run through these quickly. Yay, they say. They will be quick. Expect tactics like these. Number two, here are some tactics. Okay? First tactic is found in verse one. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, right? a, a rhetorician, a, a, an order, a, a lawyer, Tertullius. And they laid the case before the governor. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. Um, you got to travel from Jerusalem. You got to travel to Caesarea, where the court is. Um, you got to get this lawyer right, off some billboard in, in, in suburban, you know, Jerusalem, who's argued before the governor before, and you got to tell him, the guy we, we hate is causing trouble all over the world. He's blaspheming in the temple, profaning it by bringing it. Gen- he's, just, he's just basically a disease. So I need you to come and argue before the highest official in the land. The guy goes, oh, okay, big case. Yep, we're going to do it next week. We've got to travel for a couple of days. Five days, be ready. Any attorneys in the room? You want that case? You know what that spells? That spells, we're going to have you tell the powers that be what we think, and uh, please don't get confused with any of the facts. We already have the conclusion. We figured this out, okay? So you just go and argue the case. You, you say what we, we, we tell you investigations, right? Due diligence, not going to have any of that. You know what we call that on the streets? We call that a rush to judgment, letter A. Expect that. Every time someone criticizes Christianity, I want to ask them a couple of questions. Tell me about your investigation of Christianity. And number two, can you sit down with me and let's, 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 let's engage in some investigation, okay? They don't want investigation with me because I'm a disease, right? Narrow-minded, bigoted disease. And They don't want to investigate it themselves because they've already seen several episodes on cable and YouTube and have watched The Da Vinci Code and even read half of it. They know what they're talking about. They don't want to sit down and reason together. And they don't have any time. They've already decided. They read some stuff on the internet. They saw some stuff on on, on MSNBC. They they know. They know. So they're not going to sit down and think this through with us. They rush to judgment. Happens all the time, and you just need to be ready for that. The preconceived ideas. I have to ask people, have you read the Bible? Yeah, yeah, I've read parts of it. I, I know it. Okay, well, have you, like, I mean, have you read it? No, read it, like the, like, like the whole thing. How about the New Testament? You read that? I read parts of it. You are a bunch of bigots. Okay, well, can, can you read it? Can we read it? Don't, don't have time for that. It's called the rest of judgment is dumb tactic used all the time. Then, what's happening? The people that did not like Paul, that saw him in the temple, the crowds in the temple, they went now 
to the Sanhedrin. They went to the Sanhedrin, to the top of the Sanhedrin. They went to Ananias. And now they're coming with the whole Sanhedrin, we're assuming, or at least some of the Sanhedrin, some of the elders, and they've got a, a Roman attorney, perhaps, whatever he is, his background, Tertullius, and uh, they're gonna now go to the governor. So they're, they're pushing this up the chain. Um, I came home from sixth grade one day, fifth grade, my elementary school. <coughs> I told my older brother, man, I got in real trouble today. He's gonna think in one of two categories. Either you got in trouble, like we would get in trouble in fifth and sixth grade, um, by, by like, offending the wrong person. And, um, and, and, and there was a park next to our elementary school. And uh, they would say, this was the terminology on our campus. I don't know about yours. They, they, they would get mad. We'd get in an argument. And he'd, they'd say, you're chosen. And that was not a theological compliment. Or, or it, was, it, was, it was we're fighting after school next door. We all knew where. We know where the fights were. So you're chosen. Right? And, and so we would have the fight next door. Now, if I came home, I was like, I got in a big trouble with my, you know, at school today. My brother might think, oh, did you get in a fight? Uh, or if I, if I paused, he'd say, did you get sent to the principal's office? But that's another kind of trouble, right? Now, there's a lot of, like, hall monitors <laughs> uh, that get me in trouble, the tattletale people. And uh, perhaps if the, if the ball you know, snowballed big enough, I, I would end up in the principal's office. Not often. You should know that. My parents are watching. I would not, it wasn't often. It wasn't often. <laughs> and I'd get in a couple fights. At, yeah, not very, like to talk my, I talk my way out of most of them, but get in a couple fights. So one is like mano a mano. You're going to go fight in the, in the park next door. And the other one is the tattlers, right? And all the people that just don't want to deal with you, they keep pushing you up the chain so you can get in trouble. This is the tactic of the world. We're going to get you reported. I mean, we are just absolutely the narc society right now, right? Get you reported. You offended me. You, you, were, you were somehow, you did put whatever labels they put on so they can get you in trouble. Get you in trouble at work, get you in trouble in the neighborhood, get you in trouble on the board you're on, get you in trouble on the, on the, in the organization you're in, the guild you're in, whatever. This is how it works. Number two, I'll put it this way, letter B. They vilify to authorities. If they can get you vilified, and make you a bad person in your little corner of the world, they'll do it. They'll even do it in families. If you got people that don't like your Christianity and you're one of the only Christians in your extended family, you watch. They will work to try and make sure that whoever the matriarch or the patriarch of your family, they don't, they're, they're gonna complain. This is the tactic. It isn't like, let's sit down and figure this out. Let's read, let's, you and me, I don't like what you're saying. You sit down and let's sit down at a coffee shop and let us figure this out. You bring your case, I'll bring my case, I'll tell you why I don't like it. No, it's like, uh, they, they, they're bigots, right? They're, they're, you know, they're just afraid, they're phobic of this, that, or the other. Up the chain. And they get you in trouble that way. Some of you lost clients, some of you lost promotions, some of you lost jobs over that. Verses one through four, and I read it with enough sarcasm in, in my voice, right? So Tertullius starts leaning into all this. You already got Ananias, you got the elders, you got Tertullius, this guy we don't know anything about. And then, hey, he gets on the stand. Hey, Felix, Felix, you're so, you look how much peace we have. You're so smart, you're foresight, you saw things for anyone else. Excellent, Felix, excellent. Reforms are being made for our nation. I can't even believe all the things you've done for the nation. It's crazy. Every way, everywhere, just all times, every, just under every little corner. Man, we just look around and we just are so thankful for you. Right? And, you know, we don't want to take you very long. I know you got stuff to do. And you look so nice. Your tie, by the way, beautiful. I beg you, in your kindness, you're so kind. How are the kids? Are they doing okay? Just hear us briefly. We got a disease we need you to deal with. Right? Paul is here. Just a jerk. Okay. All this kissing up that's going on here. I mean, there was a lot of that going on in Jerusalem before it got to Caesarea. Now it's in Caesarea. Let's just call it this, and then I'll explain it. Let her see. They consolidate opposition. There's a consolidation of opposition by people being nice to each other against you. Have you noticed the alliances being built? You go back to the Old Testament. Absalom didn't like his father, right? He went around and ingratiated himself to everybody. He sat there and tried to make friends, and he, he, he talked about how great it would be if he was in charge. And super nice guy. That's happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you. Someone didn't like your stand for Christ, and they are going to get people around you to oppose you. They're going to consolidate as much power. If they can't go up, we're going to have the mob that isn't going to like you. 
And the way they do that is they're so friendly to each other. Jot this reference down, Luke chapter 23, verse 12. You can look at the two preceding verses. Herod and Pilate did not like each other, but guess what? Luke is careful to point out, they became friends over their opposition to Christ. And when he was dressed up in those purple robes and sent to Pilate, they were like, well, I don't know, we should get together and play golf sometime. They got nice with each other because of the old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Someone may not like you because of your anti-abortion stance. That's how they'll say it. Anti-choice, I guess is how they'll say it. You believe in the sanctity of life. You don't care if it's a rape or incest. That child is a child. We wouldn't kill the child no matter what. That's your view. And someone's going to hate you for that. And then over here, you're going to talk about heterosexual marriage, that this is the only sanctioned thing that God has ever created. And everything else is a perversion of that. And then someone else is going to not like you for that. But guess what they're going to do? Right? These people are going to join in together. And they do that in consolidating their opposition to Christians. I've seen it so many places. Verses nine and nine, uh, 8 and 9. Verse 8. By examining him yourself, Felix, you'll be able to find out from him about everything. We get. You're going to see it our way. I trust me on this. I'm going to tell you all kinds of things, and you're going to see it for yourself. And the Jews said, we've seen it too. We know it. They joined in the charge, affirming all these things were so. Were all these things so? No. He wasn't a plague. No. Right? He was stirring up some riots. I'll give you that. And he did talk about Jesus of Nazareth. True but it wasn't the hick, brainless, stupid thing that they're saying it was, and he didn't profane it. So, but they're all in the echo chamber, all in the echo saying this, and everyone's just moving forward. The modern phrase for that is the hive mind, letter D. They prefer the hive mind. Together, they sit there in the echo chamber. In the old days, we used to call it group think. The group think takes place. Everyone in the din of consolidating their opinion, they just listen to themselves. Social media, by the way, is perfect for Satan to utilize the hive mind mentality. Someone doesn't like you. They're gonna try to build their case against you, even if they don't name you in their tweets, right? In their posts, by finding other people that are going to fire them up to agree with them that they don't like you. And that's gonna be, at some point, because of your Christianity. And I'm just gonna tell you the hive mind, the group thing, the din of consolidated thinking, the one brain that they have together. I just wanna tell you this, Ephesians chapter six, it's not their brain. It isn't a vote. The group think is not just the group think. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against spiritual principalities and power, cosmic forces of evil, spiritual forces of darkness. And all I'm telling you is here's the thing. Satan does not, and all of his spiritual henchmen do not want Jesus to be proclaimed as the way of salvation. Here's the deal. Every single ethical thing, as I said last week, that God has told us to do is for human flourishing. It is for the good of humanity. We're not a plague on society. If they just listen to what we're saying, we would be the biggest blessing to society. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. You listen to us, society would thrive. I guarantee it because there are places where it's happened, and it happened in America at one time. It didn't happen in now. And all I'm telling you is that this is a satanic opposition to God. And so we need to know the group think, the hive mind, Right? All of this kind of like echo chamber, the one who's making that echo and, and really providing all this without being too spooky here, I'm just going to tell you, it comes from beyond the domain of human beings and minds. This is what's happening. The Bible says you should be wise to it. You should not be ignorant of the schemes of the enemy. He wants people to not like Christians. You couldn't have these same kinds of campaigns against other religions or other groups. You just couldn't try it in your mind. When you see these ads, like I saw an ad that said, the only church that illuminates, it was a picture of a burning church at night. The only church that illuminates is one that's burning. Right, let's just replace church with mosque and see how that goes. Right? Think that's going to work? Or how about a Buddhist monastery? The only Buddhist monastery that provides light is one that's on fire. No one would buy it. Why? Because it's a satanic opposition. You wonder why only evangelical Christianity, Bible-believing Christians, are the target and the punching bag for society? It's because it's satanic. People are looking for fanciful expressions of of supernatural power. Here's one, and there's nothing fancy about it. Satan doesn't want to do fanciful tricks to out himself. He wants to make it clear in the group think of our day, the hive mind of the modern era, this din of collective opinion. All right, well, that was so encouraging, Pastor Mike. Pastor Mike, more, more, more. Do this more. Preach like this more. All right, let me encourage you. 
Do you see the third point has no verses next to it? Because I gotta go, I gotta give you some air. Okay? Remember truths like these. Right? When you're thinking through right, the criticisms that we're gonna get, when you're thinking through the, the tactics, the satanic tactics that we're gonna rush to judgment, vilify to authorities, consolidate opposition, prefer that hive mind and only think in the group think. Just remember truths like these. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Let me read it for you. So Jesus suffered outside the gate. You know, you'd only crucify someone out. You wouldn't got to crucify within the walls of Jerusalem. You got to go outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. He was going to die so that people could be forgiven. I'm forgiven because Christ died outside the gates of Jerusalem in nakedness and beaten and bloodied on a, on a Roman cross. Okay? And it says, therefore, verse 13, let us go out. Let's, let us go to him. Can't skip those words. Let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. I'm not, I don't want a martyr's complex out of you. I don't want that. But I do want you to say, I am willing to suffer with Christ and say, if they didn't like him, they're not going to like me. I get that. Paul was honored to be called the same names Jesus was, not because he was a martyr. He preferred nice compliments to criticisms but he was willing to endure the criticism because of passages like this, truths like this. Christ died outside the camp, go outside the camp, bear the reproach he endured. Why? Verse 14, for here we have no lasting city. Oh, we have a city. I live in a city here in South County. Not my lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. And guess who's on the throne? The one who was bloodied outside the gate that everyone hates because he believes in heterosexual marriage and sanctity of life, and the Bible is true, and there's only one way to God. He believes all those things. He wants us to believe and promote all those things, and he was hated. We're going to be hated, but here's the thing. He's also going to be the king on this throne. Letter A, we stand with Christ, and every time you take a hit, you lose a client, you lose a promotion, you get ragged on by your brother-in-law, just remember, you stand with Christ. Christ was reproached. You're reproached. It's okay. I'm in good company is what I'm trying to say. Letter B, Romans chapter one. Paul, talking about himself, Romans one, verses one through six. He talks about the gospel, the good news of the, of, of the gospel. What is it? Well, it's one that was promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, verse two says. That's a mind boggler. Like, nee, 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 nee. what are you talking about? For a thousand years of written biblical history, from 1445 B.C., to 400 AD, from Genesis to Malachi, God was talking about the coming solution to the problem of sin. And then, like a miracle, there was a pause for 400 years. I want you to think about that. 400 years. Even while it was going on, the Jews knew it was going on. And they said, these are the years where there's no prophet. There's no revelation from God. There's nobody that, like Elijah or Elisha or Isaiah or someone coming on the scene proving the credentials as a prophet and speaking for God. That was the consensus among the religious Jews. 400 years, God goes silent. And then John the Baptist comes on the scene and we have a prophet in the new covenant era. It's about to be inaugurated and Christ comes and fulfills every last thing in the Old Testament that was said about his first coming. He fulfills them all. And the point is that you and I couldn't say, well, maybe the Old Testament was written... You know, like after the old time, before the new, I mean, because it, it looks like it's too, like city he was born in, what tribe he come from, that he would die and suffer and rise again after that. I was just written after the fact. 400 years God put a pause on it, so none of us could say that. And in Germany, they started to say that in the seminaries, and they started to teach this, and people believed it, and then God popped this library out of the Judean desert called the Dead Sea Scrolls and said, duh, I, here, here, here's a whole library dated before Christ. All of it. And the, and the thing they attacked the most was the book of Isaiah. Redactors, all those prophecies about Christ, just too specific, couldn't be written before Christ, had to be written after Christ. Probably took centuries after Christ to kind of put this masterpiece together the way that it works so well to affirm Christ. It was the first scroll that was pulled out, taken to St. Mark's Monastery in Jerusalem. They couldn't figure out what it was. They knew it was old. They took it to the, what's now the Albright Institute. A guy was there doing a PhD dissertation. So he had all the best cameras in the mid-20th century tripods, everything. He happens to be there. And they start taking pictures of the first find that was publicly unscrolled before the people in the mid-20th century. And guess what scroll it was? Complete scroll of the whole book of Isaiah in one piece predating Christ. This is what God does to make it very clear. He was declared to be who he was by the prophets that foretold it. And there's no religious book that does that, just the Bible. 
And he was declared with power to be the son of God. How? By the resurrection, verse four says, from the dead. Last week's topic. Those are his credentials. Try and disprove it. Go, just try. Go this week, disprove it. That Christ did not historically rise from the dead. Well, people don't rise from the dead. This guy did. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And because of that, let's just put it this way, letter B, Christ is king and he proved it. The city hasn't come yet, right? We're, we don't have the society that Christ is going to inaugurate, but he is the king and he proved it. Predictive prophecy, the resurrection of Christ, and then he's calling everybody to obey. If you read the rest of the passage, the changed lives of 2,000 years now of people following Christ whose lives are changed like our lives are changed, if you're a Christian here this morning, forgiven, passionate, zealous, praying, reading the Bible, and driven to serve Christ in our generation, that's not a mistake. That's not a sociological weird thing. It's God at work, and he's proving that he is king. Second, Corinthians, or Second Thessalonians chapter 1, letter C, verses 3 through 12. I won't take time to read that because I'm out of time. It's your homework assignment. But the, here, here's the executive summary of that. You're suffering now. Christ is coming back. You won't suffer anymore. And those who afflicted you, he's going to punish. Here's the problem. Right? We're being criticized. And at some point, our kids or grandkids may be imprisoned like Paul was. But every single person that opposes Christianity is either going to be converted dramatically like Paul was. And I pray for the militant new atheists. You got weird things being said by Dawkins this week if you watch that. Like, what are you saying? It's like, you're, are, you, are you backing down on any of this? Well, he's not officially backing down, but he's saying some pretty weird things to, to be pro-Christian in this era, at least Christian culture. And I'm thinking to myself, Liz, I pray we have another Apostle Paul among the most prolific anti-Christian writers. But if we don't, and they don't, they will face the judgment of God. I call that vindication. God's people will be vindicated. Let her see. We will be vindicated. And you need to know, every knee will bow. Those in heaven, earth, under the earth. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's not a critic that criticizes you for standing with Christ or his morality that isn't going to eat all of their words. Every one of them. Every one of them. And you have to be ready to stand with Christ no matter what criticism comes. This whole series, we've got seven more sermons to go. It's going to help us know how to deal with this. What do we do? How do we, how do we counter it? Is there any way to mitigate any of this? We'll look at all that in this series. Let's pray. God, help us, please, to be better Christians that start with not being ashamed, not being afraid, not being willing to be counted with you. Now, God, we, you've warned us. You warned us in Matthew 7 that we shouldn't cast our pearls before swine. And there's times, as it says in Proverbs, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't correct a fool. We're just going to invite a beating. So we know it's not just marching around with a, with a sandwich board around us that, that says all of our Christian theology. But God, when we're there, maybe for some of us this week, it will be in that lunchroom or in that conversation at the coffee shop. It'll be clear. This is an open door for me to say, yes, I stand with Jesus Christ. I stand with what he said. He's the resurrected king. The prophets foretold him. There's no getting around the fact that he is the king and he will vindicate every person that stands with him. May we be bold enough to say that, not ashamed of the son of man before people. We know that if we're not, you won't be ashamed of us. And so God, we want you to give us that boldness to stand up for what is right in this generation. And may we do it, not because we're martyrs, not because we love being castigated or criticized, but because we want to stand with you and we're willing to endure whatever comes. If we have to be bullied for our faith, we're going to be bullied. That's fine. But we'll, we'll go outside the gates to you and bear the reproach that you endure. In Jesus' name, amen.